Okie dokie. <clears throat> so you're here for uh, HTML CSS programming, right? Yeah. Good. Brand, 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 brand new people. I have to go over a bunch of stuff with you. Uh, let's see. Let's start here and work our way forward. Um, this is the URL I wrote down here at www.bhacker.com. This is the website that comes up when you go to that URL. And I put right next to it, bhacker at itu.edu. Best way of reaching me. Actually, it's quicker than the telephone. I answer my email faster than I answer my voicemail. So, because I get that everywhere. It's on my Excel sheet. Now it's integrated into my car, so I can get it even while I'm driving. So, but you don't want me to answer my email while I'm driving. So, uh, well, I know the rest of the people in the world probably don't want me to answer my email. Uh, but what do you get when you go to this website? Here, you get everything you need for the course. It's brand, brand new, new people don't have EMS access yet. And last weekend I said, I kept saying EMS all over the place. And finally, like at the end of the class, someone said, what's the EMS? <laughs> so maybe I should start out by just explaining that. It stands for Education Management System. That's what the EMS stands for. <clears throat> that's where you're going to upload all of your assignments. And uh, that's where I do all of the grading for all of your assignments. So that's very important to get access to. However, if you don't have access because you're a brand new student, you're going to need to get access, and there's going to be a little lag time, but don't worry, because you can get everything you need from this website without having to go into the EMS. Eventually, the EMS will be populated with all of the class materials and everything, and they'll be identical, hopefully, in content, except for the EMS will have an upload box um, to put your assignments in, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but uh, if you don't have it, up in there at the top of the screen, way up there, it says tech support at itu.edu. That's the best number, and uh, that's kind of a new thing for me now. I'm pointing out tech support email addresses on the first day of class. The tech support, don't bug me. Don't send me assignments. Don't, don't harass the TAs or anybody. Ha harass those people. Tech support at itu.edu. Send them a ton of email messages. They'll answer your questions, hopefully. Well, don't send them a ton. I mean, you know, but otherwise we're probably going to ignore you after a while. Uh, <laughs> But those are the people that you need to contact if you have a question about the EMS that haven't gotten logged in yet, have a problem with it, or something of that nature. Um, this system does not require any registration. You don't even have to log in. You don't have to do anything. You just go to the URL, and you're going to click on Summer 2011, which is this current one. If you look at, you probably saw something that said independent study on it, but that, uh, if don't uh, look at that. If you're brand new people, you're not taking independent study classes anyway right now. Uh, but don't be concerned with that link. It's just, uh, if you're interested, it's just a preview of all of the other classes I've ever taught here that some students take by independent study. Um, but uh, for the purposes of what you're doing, you've got right here, we've got Mondays from 3 to 5. Here's our class box. If you click on the class box, <coughs> what we've got is uh, the syllabus, which I'm going to go over today. And uh, underneath the syllabus, we've got five assignments that you'll need to do for the course. And we have... Oh, about 13 lectures. It's going to be about a 13 to 15 week course, give or take a week or so. Um, depends on the schedule. And uh, a quick announcement, just so you remember, next Monday is Memorial Day. So it's supposed to be the kickoff of summer, so you're supposed to be at the beach, playing golf, hiking, <laughs> um, I don't know, jet skiing. Um, if there's still some snow left in Tahoe. You could go up skiing if you wanted to. You're not supposed to be here, so don't come here, do one of those activities or an activity of your own, and then uh, that's what you do on Memorial Day in the United States. Oh yeah, to consume a lot of beer, or, you know, <laughs> alcohol, your, your alcohol of choice, and a potato chips, that's the American custom, and hot dogs and hamburgers from a barbecue. Yeah. That's a cultural lesson for today. <laughs> And then that, that way on Tuesday you can feel sick to your stomach from all the hot dog and the beer. And then you'll have sunburn on you. So you can, everyone will see you went to the beach that day. And hopefully, hopefully it won't be raining. I actually heard that it's going to be overcast this coming up weekend. So that might put a damper on everything but perhaps the barbecue. Who knows? So. All right, so I'm going to go over the, assignment, the assignments a little briefly, show you a preview of a couple of them. I'm going to wait, though, later in the course to go over those. As we go through the course, I'll be going over some of these materials. 
Every week I'll go over a lecture. These are PowerPoint lectures I also video record. So if I get out of this box here and I go into the class that started uh, last weekend, the software engineering course, you can see in here I've got this little link called Video Lectures. If I click on that, what I've got is uh, basically what I'm recording right now, where it says, uh, it will probably won't say the date, instead it will say, or it might say the date, I might put the dates on it, and then it will say week one, week two, week three, because just in case you miss a week or something of that nature, you can go back in and you can watch the videos and see exactly what you missed. Um, the videos are recording on my computer, so you don't have to worry about if the screen's obstructed or something of that nature, it gets recorded directly from the source. And hopefully the volume will be okay so that you can you can hear it as well. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's pretty good quality. It's HD quality. And those videos actually get uploaded um, into YouTube. Um, and the YouTube URL, if you're interested in that, because uh, there's a bunch of other stuff out there too. All you have to do is click on one of the videos and it will actually take you to the YouTube site. It's under BJ Hacker. So you have to go to J. Oops. No, it's, ta it's talking now. Let's turn that off. There we go. So you can see it just brings up and you'll see uh, on the BJ Hacker site, you'll see a bunch of uh, you know, miscellaneous videos for all the classes essentially on the same site. Um, all of your other uh, classes will be recorded as well. There's some teachers that do it on the computer. There's some that do it. They just record it up naturally with the video recorder. And sometimes the quality isn't so good with the video recorder, so I prefer to do it on the computer. Um, so uh, let me get back to our class. And uh, actually, this is probably one of the easiest classes, you'll, and most enjoyable classes, you'll probably take. Uh, especially if you have a computer science or software engineering background. If you don't, this will be a, an interesting class and will be a fun class as well. It just won't be as easy. Uh, but it doesn't really matter because you're not learning a programming language. You're learning HTML and CSS. So HTML, hypertext, markup language, CSS, cascading style sheets doesn't really cover very much. <laughs> if you've already taken a full web development course, you're going to be extremely bored in this class. Uh, I am going to give you a little bit on JavaScript as well. I'm going to add in you know, some lightweight scripting languages because it gives the HTML and the CSS a little bit more functionality. But really the focus of the course is on the text markup. It's putting images on websites. It's putting in anchor links to stuff. Using, uh, using tables, uh, all sorts of different HTML tags. Comes in handy for website development, comes in handy for, um, I don't know, if my, well, MySpace used to have you, you could use HTML in that. Some email programs, you can write HTML code in there. Um, a lot of, you know, things where you can actually kind of do your own markup with HTML compatib compatibility. And so you'll be armed and dangerous in terms of being able to use those kind of technologies. Um, but if you are an experienced web developer, you're probably in the wrong course. That's what I'm saying. This is great, class is great for uh, web, uh, excuse me, for business people uh, or for I IS, IT kind of people who want to get familiar with HTML and CSS and have a background in it. So don't expect heavy duty web programming, is what I'm saying. So I don't want to get your expectation up too high. Uh, or make it too low either. We will cover everything there is to know about web pages and HTML code. And uh, we will touch a little bit on JavaScript, not too much. It's not a JavaScript course, but I'm going to use JavaScript as an example of how you can integrate into HTML scripting languages, functions. I can write functionality and stuff. And JavaScript is usually the first scripting language that most HTML beginning HTML students start learning. Uh, it's a little easier than PHP or Python or some of the other kind of interfaces that you could use. So it's a nice language to get started with. So the course will examine how to create web pages using HTML. We'll also use cascading style sheets, which are very popular these days. Um, a CSS is a style sheet kind of like an HTML page. Actually, it can be done inside of an HTML page. You can define your style information right there in the page. Or you can put it in separate files. So I'll be showing you both methods. We'll be writing things and using both methods. Every one of your programs programs, excuse me, um, HTML pages that you'll put together, we'll use a style sheet. And a style sheet basically specifies out colors, fonts, characteristics about different tags. And HTML is all about tags, and I'll get into that within the first lecture for brand new people. Um, so what we're looking at 
is putting them both together and creating basic website and learning basic tools for HTML website development. Uh, you could go through and look at the learning outcomes on your own, but basic ability to, to write HTML code is the learning objective uh, that you're primarily interested in hopefully getting. We don't have a textbook for this course. <sighs> Problem with the textbook is I couldn't find anything that was just HTML and CSS that was not intimidating for someone without a background in it. Uh, most of the books out there are higher level, they're more development tools, development oriented. Uh, but throughout the course, I'll be showing you a couple of websites. Some of you may already be familiar with them already, like the W3 schools and stuff, where you can actually type in your HTML code and see what it looks like <coughs> right next to it. And that's and then you have tons and tons and tons of resources on the internet. I mean, in fact, if anything is explained about any particular technology, the most it's how to write HTML. <laughs> Not so much with the CSS, but uh, how to write HTML codes all over the internet. I, mean, I could come up with millions of websites for you. Uh, if you're curious, just go into Google and type in HTML. You'll see this tutorial, that tutorial. That, it's way over over covered, I should say. So I don't think you're going to need really need a book for this course. Is what I'm saying. Right, let's take a look at the grading. This is primarily the concern of most students when they start and end the course. So uh, we've got a final exam. As I mentioned before, I video record everything, so if you miss a class meeting, um, and there is no class next Monday, for those of you who came in late, uh, then what ends up happening is you have to go somehow figure out what we missed, so you go and watch the video. I don't grade on attendance. If you look in the box here, there's nothing here on attendance. However, attendance is one of the requirements. The way I make it a requirement is that I make the final exam and in-class activity for which you will have to show up in person to take Otherwise, you'll get an incomplete in the course. So if any of you existing students have incompletes, it's because either we lost your final exam score somehow, which a couple of them did get lost, or um, you didn't take it. But I think all of you guys took it, so I remember seeing you. Uh, and then uh, everything else is based upon assignments throughout the course. There is a midterm, but it's a take-home exam. And the midterm will be something of a project. So it's not going to be... because. Think about HTML. How in the world am I going to ask theoretical questions or concept questions on HTML and CSS? Now, I'm probably going to have to say, create a web page that does this, this, and this, and you'll put it together. So it's going to be very hands-on-ish. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do for final exam. <laughs> That's going to be pretty hard. I don't want you to write. I don't want you to memorize HTML tags. Although, you'll probably get about 50 or more percent of them. In fact. Some of you have 50 or more percent of them memorized already. I don't know, sort of bold and underline and all that stuff. But uh, some of the other unique tags might, you might not be familiar with. Uh, but you don't have to memorize anything. Uh, so I have no idea what I'm going to do for the final. <laughs> I'll have to figure that out. I've got about 13, 14 weeks before I get there, so I'll figure that out. I'll have something to put together for you. Uh, let's see, so the midterm is going to be take home halfway through the course, and it's going to be based upon uh, a, a practical, you know, hands-on kind of activity. The uh, CSLO for brand new people, in the old days it used to be, it was called Course Student Learning Outcome. In the old days it used to be, oh, and how did you feel about this course? It was a kind of a self-assessment kind of thing. Um, it's changed a bit throughout the years, and now it's more of an essay. So I'll have you write an essay, and what I'll probably end up doing is pick something related to a couple, maybe five or six different topic choices, and you'll write an essay on. And it's basically to give you some practice in writing. The more you practice writing, the more professional you're going to sound, hopefully, um, or be eventually. So the, gain, the goal of that is to essentially see, have you express some ideas about something you've learned, the course, but also have you practice your writing an exercise where you might have to do some minimal research or something. And uh, if you're if you've taken one of my classes last term, and, uh, and the CSL is going to be the same. I mean, different topics, but the same format. You just pick a topic, you write an essay, your choice, and you uh, get. Uh, um, we didn't have the scores. You know, and I was kind of, kind of disappointed. We didn't have the Turnitin scores, but we did run it through Turnitin.com. But half the scores got jumbled. <laughs> Needless to say, it's been a battle working with that EMS for like the last two weeks, so I don't even want to talk about it anymore. It's all stress anxiety in me already. 
It uh, wouldn't go quite as well as I thought it would in terms of the turnitin.com tool. Um, however, in fact, it would be nice to integrate it right in there, but that didn't happen. So, um, it will be checked. The CSL essay will be checked. Um, whether you'll actually see the percentage that comes back, we'll see what happens this term. So, um, I do believe that they're coming out with a new version of that EMS that's going to start in the fall, which is why they're not doing very much upgrade to the existing one, because it's going to be replaced. So, they're a little, you know, you basically have to work with what you have right now, unfortunately. Um, homework, the other part of the course, 5%. It doesn't seem like that much, but it's probably the most work you'll do in the course, <laughs> and you only get five. Five points per assignment, 25 points total. Eh, that doesn't even seem fair when you think about it. Actually, after I've been grading the last term, I'm like, this isn't really fair. <laughs> That's a lot of work for 25 points. And then that one, and then that one. They're all worth the same, 25, 25, 25. However, that's the 25 points that you're going to like spend the most work on that you're going to get the less, least amount of credit for is going to be the best learning experience. So that's where you get an opportunity to practice. And unfortunately for you, for this class, I tailored the assignments so they're really only worth five points, and they're really only five points worth of effort. They're not like 100 points worth of effort, and you're only getting five points for it. So it, they're, pretty, they're pretty simple exercises that you'll have to do, and we'll take a look at a couple of them. Um, so we know that the final exam, uh, the week is usually the last week of class, the one week before the last week of class, I'll announce it. I do have a final exam review where I'll tell you um, what essentially to study for for the final exam. So, <laughs> so you'll have everything you need to know. And because I usually like to write the exam, then tell you what's on it. And then <laughs> you come in and you take it. I can't tell you what's on it until I write it. So yeah, that's how it usually happens at the end there. Academic dishonesty. We actually didn't have too many problems with that this term. Um, this last term, I should say. Fewer problems in this last term than in previous terms. So maybe we, ITU just had a batch of students that came in that were all academically dishonest. And now they all went away. Now we have new batches that come in. And only a couple lingering cheaters are still out there. In fact, I didn't really notice that much cheating with the final exams either. People were pretty quiet. And people were just, you know, there was a little cheating going on. Uh, if you plagiarize something, at least change the name on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't think that was going to be a no-brainer, wouldn't it? <laughs> then you're like, well, didn't I already grade this guy's paper? And you're looking at this guy, what's well, the wrong student? Well, how many people have turned in this paper? Like five people have turned in the same paper with the same name on it. <laughs> Wait a minute now. <laughs> and then I had a couple of wise people who <laughs> uploaded stuff that wasn't even the right stuff. It was like a blank file. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute now. <laughs> People try to get away with everything. Uh, but if you do, then you probably ended up with a D or an F on your uh, <laughs> grade report that just came out. <laughs> Which means you're probably going to end up having to talk to me for some strange reason. Hey, how come I got a bad grade? Well, and then I've got him in groups, so I know what category you fell into as to what grade you got. So, well, you know one is an F. So. F means you plagiarized. Or you just didn't turn all your stuff in. I know people are sitting here going, but I got an F. Uh-oh, wait a minute. Something's wrong. There are those rare cases in which the EMS messes up. And the EMS did mess up a few times. So if you didn't get what you were expecting, I'll let me know. The sooner the better. That way I can fix it before the grades become permanent. So. Grading uh, scale is about the same as what you'd normally find anywhere else, except for the fact that I don't give out A pluses. I know that there is an A plus in this school, but 4.0 is a 4.0. You can't get anything higher than a 4.0. There's no sense in an A plus. There is a sense in a B plus or a C plus because that gives you a half a point above. But an A is an A. So the best you're going to do in my class is an A. Don't ask me for an A plus. You're not going to get it. All right. The last part of the uh, syllabus is, and if you're wondering, this syllabus came from the bhacker.com website. So you can download it yourself. You don't have to, you don't have to like, quickly read it while I'm scrolling through it this fast. Uh, you may download it, print it out, put it on your bedroom wall. I don't know. Frame it. Kind of do whatever you want with it. Print it out on green, yellow, and blue paper. Some colors out of it. So. Okay, so what do we got going on here? We have the schedule. And so I'm probably going to try to stick to this schedule. The moment we have our, on the assignment, on the uh, right hand column, we have this thing called assignment one due, assignment two due. This is where the five assignments are in here. Midterm is about halfway through. Put it at about week eight. It's probably about week six or so I'll be announcing it. I'll have two or three weeks to work on it. It'll be due before the end of the course. The CSLO essay is not due until the very last day of the final exam. It's not due until the very, well, it won't be given until the very last week of class. The assignments in here 
And the way I run all of my classes, and the IT people don't like it because it bunches everything up at the end, I don't set any due dates. You won't notice any due dates in the schedule. Because we have some students sitting here today. Next week, hopefully we're not going to have anybody. The following week, we're going to have a different group of people who come. And some of them will be here for the first time. And then the following, it takes about three or four weeks because people are still registering. So if I had an assignment due date, and I have to adjust it like 10 times for 10 different groups of people who showed up at 10 different start times. And, or people show up late, they just register, and then how come I'm already late from this assignment? I have one day to turn this in. So what I've done is I set the very last day of the course for the assignment due dates for everything. Except for the posted midterm that I'll have, we'll have a date for that. Um, so that you repeaters already know what happens though the very last day of the assignment due date. The EMS goes down. <laughs> and it went down. Traditionally, it goes down every single term. Usually the week before, eh, four or five days before the last day to turn everything in, every student is hitting the, is trying to upload at the same time <coughs> and it can't handle all the traffic and the EMS just dies completely or loses assignments or something of that nature. If you don't want to end up in that situation, when you get yourself done, start uploading it and uploading it all the way throughout the course, then you'll never have a problem. Never have a problem at all. Um, and uh, what we've got, I, what I've, I've done is I've kind of put it out week one, two, three numbers on the left hand side. So around week three, you probably should be doing assignment number one. So for you guys, this is week number one. We skip a week because we've got Memorial Day. So. We have three instead of two weeks, actually. So it's really four weeks away, which is a very long, that's a month before anything to do. Because the problem with the first assignment is if you're brand new to it, you don't know anything, and it's gonna be too challenging for you. So you gotta get up to speed. So you gotta ramp it up a little bit. And then after that, they're due every other week-ish. So every other week, you probably wanna turn something in. Um, and what I'm actually gonna try and do is start the grading earlier. Because I learned a valuable lesson. I waited till the last minute. I think it's all the students waited till the last minute. But then I noticed that some students actually posted like months ago. And I could have graded all that stuff already. <laughs> so this time I'm actually going to start my grading link. And I'll tell you, oh, yeah, I'm going to start a batch of grading. So if you want to see how you did, you know, you can, I can do them in slow batches rather than waiting at the end. That's a little too much to do. A little too intense. So um, hopefully the grading will happen a little bit earlier as well. Are there any questions about the schedule, about um, how the course is going to run in general? No? Nobody ever has any questions? That's why I put the email address on the board. I always get a ton of questions on the email address, but never get any, nobody ever asks a question in the class. Although I'm surprised we have a new batch of students, and they're more talkative. This last weekend, they're asking questions. Oh, so where do these students come from? <laughs> They're not the traditional IT students. I don't know where they're coming from. Any a question? No. It's better heard noises. Um, all right, so if we don't have any questions, I'm going to move right along. Uh, the way the class works is I'm going to uh, lecture. Well, actually, I'm gonna, let me show you one of the assignments, actually. Uh, so the lecture is all PowerPoint. The assignments, here's assignment number one. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just download it here real quick. So you can kind of get a feel for the uh, caliber uh, of the course because you, there's, we're still within the add drop pay, uh, add drop time, so you can actually I think we have a pretty liberal add drop time period around here, so you can still change your mind back out of the course or tell your friends, hey, this is a really easy course, sign up for it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're uh, you're gonna do a web page. This is very typical; every one of them is a web page. <laughs> Obviously, that's all the thing we're studying in this course. So your first assignment, you're going to create your own web page and place it on the web, which brings up a good question. How many people actually have web space out there? Nobody. No, nobody's going to raise their hand anyway. Um, IT doesn't actually give out web spaces like some other universities do. I think it's just because they haven't gotten there yet. Um, but what I'm going to do, not next week, because we're not going to be here next week, but on our second class meeting, I'm going to come out, I have got like a list of about 20 different URLs, and these are for free web spaces. And uh, there's a catch, though. 
Uh, so you can sign up for a free. You don't have to buy a book. You don't have to buy web space. So don't go out and sign up. And uh, I'll go through the list and I'll make sure they work. And then I'll put it out on vhacker.com and I'll talk about it next time we meet. And uh, so what you probably want to do early on in the course is get yourself a web website, web space. What are you going to get with that? You're going to get a location somewhere on the internet with a URL. It's probably not going to be like a name that you pick out. If you get the free one, I'm talking about the free stuff right now. It's going to be, you know www.yahoo.com forward slash, a big 10 digit number forward slash, you know, uh, something else forward slash, and maybe the last four characters or something forward slash. You know, anyway, it's going to be some unidentifiable URL that you're going to have to use, but you just cut and paste it and send it to me and say, hey, this is where my assignment's at. Because uh, the interesting thing is you can um, upload it if you want, but you don't have to. Uh, some people prefer to do everything on their computer. And you can do that with HTML. All you have to do is save a file to your desktop, as an example. Double click on the file, it'll open up in your web browser, and it'll look like a web page, which is great. Um, in fact, for all of the technologies that we're doing in this class, you can do it that way. But some people want to actually see it and go through the motions of putting it up there. What you get with the free web spaces is usually, I don't know, you don't really get a gig. You usually get like 100 to 500 megabytes, which is all you need. All of the um, Files that you'll be writing in the course are text, notepad files. And they're going to be so small, they'll fit on almost anything. Uh, in fact, you probably could fit on a 10 megabyte disk space. But you probably get a couple of 100 to 500 is what I'm thinking. And you get a bunch of ads. You know, they put up the free, you know, it's free. So they're using it for advertisement. I don't care. If your space has got ads on it, that's fine. I'm, I'm expecting that. Uh, but what you get when you do this, though, is you'll get some practice using FTP tools, File Transfer Protocol, and I'll go through that in the course as well, where you can take your file that you created and upload it using an FTP client to your website, and then you can kind of see how it looks on the website, looks in the browser, which sometimes is different, especially if you've got a bunch of images and stuff. A lot of times it's easier to put it up on a website than it is to zip all the files together. But it's your choice. When you turn it into the EMS, you'll have to give me the files. But you can also, and I'm trying to figure out how we're going to do this, um, if we could also make it so you give me a URL. Uh, but I have to work on that to see how that's going to work with the EMS, because right now it's only set up for files. Um, but uh, we're going to go through that, and uh, that's one of the first things I'm going to cover once I get more people in the class. <laughs> and uh, It's going to be uh, how to upload files, and all the tools are free. All the FTP clients will be free. And I'll demo it on both the Mac and also the Windows system. It's going to be. In fact, some of the same tools work on both. Um, some of the free websites have their own web tools. So you go and you sign up for the free website, and it'll, you'll have a control panel that you'll have access to. The control panel will have a little button. Upload. You click on it. You give it the name of the file, and it uploads for you. Um, but yeah, you'll have to. Uh, Either give me files or put it on a website and give me a URL uh, to show me what you've done, essentially, for each one of the assignments. But this first one is just having you put together a simple web page. The second one will have you put together another web page with a few more features. And uh, I'll go through that first assignment in a lot more detail as we get closer. Just sort of wanted to give you a feel for how the, um, how the assignments are essentially uh, created in terms of the nature of the assignments. So. Um, another thing is we usually go for uh, an hour, hour and a half, hour 45, two hours, something of that nature. I don't think I've ever gone past two hours. That's a lot. Because um, we don't have any breaks, you know. And so if you have to go to the bathroom to take your, answer your cell phone, to drink water, it's not rude. Just get up, go, come back. <laughs> and, uh, and it gets us in, gets us out as quick as possible. And... Uh, there's some teachers that like to take a break every half hour, every hour, 45 minutes, and then you take a 10-minute break, half people don't. Every time I take a break, nobody comes back. <laughs> so I just keep you as long as I can keep you for without losing you. And then since we break, I lose everybody. They all go anyway. So, um, so hopefully I won't lose. Well, if I do lose you, then I won't take it personally. But uh, we are. We definitely will go more longer periods of times without breaks than you probably used to perhaps unless you've taken my classes before so 
that works for and against you because I get tired of talking. So <laughs> if I have to do it continuously, I'm going to talk for less time <laughs> than if I took a break and refreshed and started all over again. And I can go forever that way. So. All right. So well, I'm not going to go forever. Don't worry. Um, let's see, I need, need to get my time piece up so I can keep track of the time. So our class will start at 3 o'clock. We're not going to change the timings of this class. Uh, we will go from 3 to 4.30-ish, 4.45-ish. If I stay till 5, I don't know. It means I've had too much coffee or something. But we'll see how far we go. Uh, so let's talk about what it is. I like this first lecture because it kind of gets into the basics of the course. And it kind of covers what it is we're going to be talking about. And I like this first slide, actually, because this has two, two words on it. And people always go, what's XHTML? Uh, and then they go, well, introduction to HTML. That's what the class said. It said HTML and CSS on it. And then uh, web basic, web design, well, that's, that's pretty basic. All right, so the world has gone XHTML. And both, you, both words are now being used interchangeably. XHTML is HTML plus XML together. It's XML compatible HTML. Now you're wondering, well, how in the world can we have different? We don't actually have different versions of HTML. We have different standards, different practices, different rules, per se, that go along with the language. So HTML is a mock-up language. It's used to format text. XML is a mock-up language that's used to format data that you don't see on the screen, but data that's embedded inside of the text or data that's being used along with the text. So it makes a lot of natural sense to be having HTML and XML compatibility and the ability to integrate both languages. And for the longest time we had HTML, we had XML. Now if we say XHTML, all it means is that we've upgraded our standard a little bit, we're making it more compatible, we're making, we're setting more rules, we're making it so that each opening bracket has a closing bracket, and all of the, all of the symbol, all of the tags that we're using, I'll get into the concept of tag in a few minutes, all the front tags match the same order as the back tags, and we're using a body, a header, a footer, and we're doing, you know, we're using all of the set to set the particular sections that we're supposed to, and we're abiding by a standard. So what you get with HTML, it's not standardized. There's different versions of it, but in practice, it's mostly uh, misused. It's, it's, I should sort of say misused, it's sloppily used. You don't have to follow, not like a real programming language. In a real programming language, what you're looking at is a syntax that you have to follow word for word. HTML, you can get away with a lot. You can never put, you know, have a font color, a font size, a font this, a font that, and just go close the fonts <laughs> without closing them individually. You know, or just forget, just reassign it to another font color, font color blue, font color red, font color orange. And what ends up happening is that the file itself is being read sequentially. So the order and I haven't discussed tags yet, so that probably some of you are going what? Well, the order is essentially you're mixing in text with a bunch of what we're calling tags. Tags are formatting syntax, and that's what we're looking at in this class, is how to create the tags to format the text. And we're going to look at both HTML and XML. We're also going to look at how to understand hyperlinking, you know, which is probably one of the most interesting parts about HTML, because uh, it's not a dynamic language, it's uh, static. It's, you put some text out on the screen, and you put it in orange, and you bold it and underline it, that's pretty much all you can do with HTML. Uh, or you can put maybe a little tag in there that says, go to this website here. And so you get more dynamic kind of, you get more event-driven kind of behavior by adding anchors or links. So one page goes to another page, goes to another page, and you create this storyboard of information. Kind of like how Microsoft Word can be used with pages. You get one page, two page, three page, same concept but we have to link them together in HTML. We just can't scroll through a page. Well, we can, but it's all one page, essentially, that fits in the browser. We're also going to look about how the tags are formed, how the HTML mock-up language is actually being used. And then uh, we're going to take a look at the W3Cs in this lecture as well as an introduction to kind of give you a little bit of exposure about what that's all about and uh, how that's being used. 
Um, so in order to start out from ground zero on HTML, we actually have to start from ground zero with the internet. And we're at the concept of what it is we're looking at. So the World Wide Web, www, you know, the internet's more than just the World Wide Web. World Wide Web is the text portion of it. It's the document support, document exchange. We have application development that goes on, different tools and services, and utilities that happen. So what we're actually doing is we're accessing cross-reference documents, and they started out being called hypertext linking. So that's how the linking concept came around. This is a history lesson through vocabulary. Hypertext, which is what the H stands for in HTML, uh, it's because that's what they used to call the documents that were on the internet in the beginning. And uh, they're still called that. It's probably the most important aspect of the web because it allows you to quickly open up web pages. So every time you open up a web page, you're really using a hypertext HTTP protocol, hypertext transport protocol, is what that stands for. And it's working with the H, which is with the hyperlink, hypertext and hyperlinks, which is basically allowing you to navigate. Um, that's about as low level as I can. That's the beginning of the internet. <laughs> I don't know if I can go any, any, any more basic than that, hopefully. Uh, hopefully that's a good starting point. So the hypertext link or hyperlink is the core of the navigation through this text system uh, through our browser. It contains references to specific web pages. You can click and quickly open up a web page using the hyperlink. And what we're looking at, and when we say web page, this is an interesting concept. When we say website, web page, are they the same thing? Web page and website. How many people say they're the same thing? How many people don't want to answer? How many people say they're different? If those people who didn't answer on the same thing would have to answer they didn't or different. A website basically consists of web pages. More than one web page? Mm -hmm. And maybe more technologies outside of the web page? Yeah. So you got maybe it. Maybe a yeah. backup source When we think of web page, it's singular. <laughs> it's a one web page. One page on the web. Website is a web page plus more web pages with links, with images, with color, with a sound maybe, with a, you know, uh, an application with a scripting language, that's a website. So, now I said find people, it's just vocabulary. Some people, yeah, I went to your webpage. I'm like, which one? <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Like, for example, my vhacker.com site is actually an open source PHP BB software that is a, technically a website versus a web page because it's an app, it's not, there's effectively there's no HTTP on that at all, actually. It's all, yeah, PHP, but um, bottom line, it's not just one page, there's multiple pages in it, so it's a website. So most people go with one or the other, they go around saying, oh, yeah, I went to your web page, it's on the web page. Or they go, and yeah, the website, it's on your website. You know, usually they use one or the other, so when in doubt, use website. Usually more applicable. <laughs> so, so, document on the web is called a web page, identified by a unique address called the Uniform uh, Resource Locator, the URL. Are you guys familiar with basic web technologies? I don't have to go that low, right? Okay, good. Um, if not, I'm going that low. URL. <laughs> so, I won't get into all the specifics of it. Uh, but you want to know what a URL is. Commonly referred to as a web address. So, then we have domain names that are attached to URLs. You guys are familiar with that concept? Uh, perhaps. So the uh, URL is uh, a type of URI. It's a uniform resource identifier, uh, which is by a code, so or by region, or by nation. Uh, so what we end up having is uh, generic terms for many different types of names and addresses that are on the, on the uh, internet as well. So we have resource identifiers that tell us whether or not we're going to a government site. And then we're going to the education sites. It's pretty standard these days. We have our .orgs or .govs in the U.S. We have I mean, internationally. We have different extensions on that as well. Those are actually on the domain names that are attached to addresses. And there's an entire. And if you take a, a networking course, you'll learn like the IP addressing schemes. And it is an internet protocol, which is what the internet's running on. Um, and we identify. IP addresses, but who remembers 1.1.9.10.5.6? But do you remember vhacker.com? <laughs> yeah, so that's where the domain names come into place. 
You don't need one for this course, actually, because your free website will be a bunch of garbage domain name. Probably advertising somebody's product or service as on, along with your website. So, All right, so the website itself refers to the location on the Internet as well, such as graphic files that belong to a company, organization, or individual. So you might say by, by vocabulary, the website is the location as well. Location that holds everything. The HTML documents, originally people created web pages using hypertext markup language, HTML. So that's where I that came from in terms of what it stands for. It's a simple language used to create web pages and create websites. It's a markup language, which means it doesn't manipulate information. So we always mix HTML with scripting languages if we want dynamic behavior. We can't do math with HTML. We can't create functions with HTML. We can't do anything. Except for markup. It's a formatting language. Uh, so it's a set of characters or symbols that define the document's logical structure and how the document should be printed and displayed. It only shows up in a web browser. So what does a web browser do? A web browser is actually kind of very similar to Notepad. Except for it's HTML compatible, which means it actually will format read the HTML tags, I'm going to get into it in a few minutes, and put everything, display everything the way it's supposed to look. That's why it doesn't matter if your web browser is picking up your page from a URL on the internet, or whether it's picking it up from your desktop on your computer, or in the file folder on your computer, it's going to show it identically the same. The only problem is people load it up, they go, how come it looks different? i got to test it, i got to put it out there. If it's linked with other documents on the internet, image files and stuff, it's got to be on the internet. <laughs> so a lot of people prefer to load it on some website somewhere, some location, because then they can link with other documents and things out there. When you move it off and you put it on your desktop, you're not on the internet anymore. You're on your local machine. You still can look at the HTML, but server applications aren't going to run correctly. They're not on a server which means a lot of those server scripting languages aren't going to run JavaScript alone because JavaScript is interpreted by the web browser. So now we're looking at web browsers because that's part of the component. The web browser is the front end, it's the interpreter. I'm going to think of it that way. If it were just Notepad, it would show you the document as is. It would show you all the tags and all the formatting. It's kind of like looking at the source of the file, if you've ever done that before in a website, if you view source. You'll see all the HTML mock-up language, um, but that's not how you want to read it. What you want to read it is through the interpretation of the browser. And so really the job of the browser is to interpret. It's an interpreter. So Browsers are kind of an easy application to build, actually, um, because there's only one way of reading something. Kind of like a programming language. You're just parsing it and processing it <laughs> and then displaying it to the user, essentially. So that's the goal of the web browser. And uh, it's based on the older language. In the older language, this was based on, going back down history, memory lane on the history lesson for today, standardized general, standard generalized markup language, SGML, was the original version of HTML. And hopefully, you can see why it got changed, because we're going through HTTP protocol, and now we're called hypertext. So we changed the name and changed the language to support web needs, because this didn't actually support the internet didn't support uh, some of the features that we currently support in HTML. What do you mean? What do you mean about the internet? And in terms of the document exchange protocols that are required for HTTP, we're looking at content that's specialized for internet viewing. So we have the integration of images, sound, files, pictures, navigation from one website to another website. Those are all those kind of new features that were added in that made HTML HTML in terms of its formatting style. And SGML never really supported any of that. Um, it defined data in the document independent of how the data was going to be displayed, essentially. The target output format refers to the medium in which the document will be displayed, such as a web page or an online help system. You can actually get, in fact, here's the interesting thing. So and most of you probably have a mobile phone, hopefully. Smartphone, iPhones, U phones. In fact, it's hard to find anyone who doesn't have a smartphone these days. So now the smartphone's actually just called the cell phone now. Because everyone had it's assumed that you have a smartphone. When you go to the HTML, excuse me, a web browser on your Samsung device or whatever, 
what you're getting is the same page as what's out there that you're getting on your computer, but it's formatted differently because you have a different browser. So the browser is what makes the columns to the left or to the right or reduces the resolution of the image of images and it formats for the device or for the platform. So we have cross-platform compatibility. We write one web page, one HTML document, viewed in all of these different components, and it all looks different depending on the device. We can actually tell, and, there's, and I'll show you this without, throughout the course, you can actually tell what browser it is. And it's almost like an if-then. If we're using Internet Explorer, do this. If we're using Firefox, do that. If we're using Chrome, do this. If we're on a mobile phone, do this. And so we can kind of create websites that are cross-platform compatible, and a lot of sites are doing this right now, actually, to modify the appearance to make it look better, customize it for different, different platforms, essentially. Um, and then we can also make it compatible using different techniques as well um, to make it more universal. Uh, one of the things that the W3C is doing is actually trying to standardize interfaces so that things look consistent among different platforms. Um, and I'll get into that later in the course. But uh, what we're looking at is the target output format is the medium of the document. And uh, now let's take a look at some HTML, because this is HTML and CSS. So the documents themselves are text documents. So for the purposes of this course, you're not using what you see is what you get website development tool. Otherwise, you don't even really need to take the course, <laughs> actually. It defeats the purpose of the course, 100%. Uh, and I can tell if you're using one because there's always information. In fact, there's tons of information that's included uh, in your website development tool that you're using to support the interface that you're using. In a web, real website development environment, you would probably use tools. For the purposes of this course, we're practicing how to write HTML code. So you're going to have to use Notepad text editor of some sorts. You don't want to use Microsoft Word. For the same reason why you don't use Word in a programming course. It's not a text editor. It's a word processor. And lo and behold, I will have a couple of students who give me assignments in Word. <laughs> okay. Just save it in the text file. Because <laughs> so, we don't want formatting from the Word file in there. We want plain text, plain nasty text. And what we're doing is we're writing text inside of this file, and we're saving it. And that's what you're giving me for your assignment. Formatting expressions are called tags. So a tag goes between and around text that we're writing. And uh, the text is displayed on the web page. It doesn't look like it, though, when you're writing it. It looks totally different because we take that text file and we load it up in our web browser that does the interpretation on it, and it creates, it creates the uh, display that we're formatting, that we're creating. So HTML ranges from a formatting commands to controls that allow users to do input. So we'll look at forms, not today. That would be way too much for the first day. <laughs> but we'll look at forms, form controls, processing. Really easy to create forms, actually. Uh, formatting the page itself into different sections or regions. Uh, we'll look at website navigation, how to do menus, how to keep the menus consistent, how to add images to the menu buttons and things of that nature. All this stuff can be done with HTML. So the tags themselves are enclosed in these brackets here. You see, you open the enclosed brackets. And they also consist of what's called a starting and an ending tag. So HTML, actually everything, starting tag is all you need. You just need to start something. Start something and then start something again and then start something again. That's sloppy HTML. XHTML requires an opening and a matching closing tag. So it's probably better to learn it correctly because eventually you're going to have to be XHTML compatible, especially if you're doing this for a company because they're, going to, they're not going to they're not going to buy the whole incompatibility. Because there's a website, and I'll show you that probably next time we meet, where you can take your document and upload it, and it can test it for you and say, well, are there any errors in this? <laughs> are there any problems with this? Because uh, what ends up happening when you write HTML code is it either works or it doesn't work. If it's working, great. We're done, right? But now, it may not necessarily be formatted well. It might not necessarily have all of the sections that it's supposed to have, and it might not actually conform to other web browsers. So companies in general are really picky about compatibility and compliance, and we want it in XHTML. So we can go to this website, validate the, yeah, web, the this website, or validate the web page, and then we can say, yes, 
it meets all the standards. Every opening bracket has a closing bracket. There aren't any images that are missing. There aren't any this, there aren't any that. There's a whole checklist of stuff that will come back and report with you, report to you with. And uh, this means essentially that it's going to be compatible with 90% of the web browsers out there. It's interesting, and we'll find out in, uh, throughout this course what ends up happening. What you think is standard HTML code looks different in Windows Explorer. Looks different in Firefox. Looks different in Chrome, actually, because the browser is interpreting the code differently. And so, if you're using the EMS, you want to use Firefox or Chrome. Don't use Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer actually doesn't support some of the features in the EMS. Actually, and they probably should put a big old "must use Chrome or Firefox" <laughs> label on the top, because so many students use the Internet Explorer and it ends up having half the features are missing, like the buttons are gone or something's missing off of the interface. Because here's what happens when you start to debug you know, HTML code. If it's not supported, it's not shown. <laughs> so we don't get error messages. It's not like a programming language where it comes back and says, oh, error on line 10. Now, unless you're working with a scripting language that's doing something like maybe PHP that's going to actually generate an error, populate, send it back out to the page, and the page is actually going to capture it or show it. That's the only, how, the only way you're going to see an error. On an HTML page, if it doesn't work, it doesn't show. It's just empty. The browser just gives up and stops and moves on to the next line. Moves on to the next line. Moves on to the next line. So you can load up a web page in Internet Explorer and not see certain buttons that aren't supported. And Internet Explorer, believe it or not, used to be like the de facto standard, not anymore. Everyone's building for Firefox or for Chrome. And I say that, and you'll know, wonder, you won't realize it until you actually see it yourself. And you're like, my website looks better. Firefox. The buttons actually show up and the color looks right. <laughs> it doesn't look right in Internet Explorer. So. Um, all right, so the tags are uh, opening and closing, and they're a uh, starting tag and ending tag that's surrounded by text and other formatting that's controlling it. Let's take a look at some common structures and some formatting tabs, uh, tags. This is lecture number one. This actually comes out of uh, information that's online right now. It came out of an old book that's actually online, and I forgot to bring I was going to bring the URL for the um, but what we've got here, and I'm not going to go through all of them because that's what we're really doing throughout the course, and I'll just go through the top one as an example. The B up there, if you can see, it's kind of small, it's just a small B. Um, and uh, what we've got is a B that says bold. So we would put an opening and a closing tag and we put text in between it, and everything that was in between would be bold, an example. You can always know the opening and the closing tags because the closing tags have this little dash right here. So we have a forward slash that says this is the closing tag and this is the opening tag. And we have a bunch of tags. That's the entire language. So now you're done with the course. <laughs> it actually it is. That's it. And what we're doing in this course is we're going through and we're learning all the tags and how to put the tags together and how to make it look nice. That's what we're doing. And then we're adding some style because we have CSS as well. But what I'm going to do is explain HTML to you first, and then I'll hit CSS. Because CSS is basically taking a bunch of these tags and writing them in different formats for them. When you say bold, how bold should bold be? Or maybe header. How big should the header be? What color should the text of the header be? And so in CSS, what we're doing is we're taking and creating a style for the header. We're saying it's italics and bold and underlined and in bright orange. That's a really valid header. Uh, but that might be the style that we want to use. The reason why we create CSS and we use that is because we want the entire site to look consistent. You get a website and they have, this is the uh, American red, white, and blue site. And everything's in red, white, and blue color. And all the fonts are the same. And, all. and it's kind of like when you go back to Microsoft Word as an example when you write a research paper. You know, you've got a title page, and introduction, body paragraphs, conclusion. Hopefully it's all using the same fonts. <laughs> it's all double spaced. If you didn't cut and paste it off the internet, it's actually formatted correctly. That's what you're doing with your website. And your style sheet is setting is setting the indentation. How much space to use on the indentation? What font size to use? What and uh, what basic format to use in inside of the entire document. And if you're familiar with HTML, you say, well, I, you know, CSS is optional. Actually, the sloppy HTML of the old days was nothing but tags. You know, it's like, 
Okay, and then five spaces. Okay, and you did everything manually. So if you want to edit that thing, impossible. I mean, if you want to change, let's say, the indent to six spaces instead of five, you got 40 pages in this. You got to go through every single one of those and change it to six. Or you want to change the font color to something, you got to go like maybe just go find and search and replace <laughs> all the, throughout the entire doc. It's a lot of editing. So now you use CSS as the fact <laughs> standard instead. You put as few tags as possible inside of the HTML document. You apply a CSS style sheet to it, and you write the style sheet outside of the HTML document, and you upload the style sheet to the website. You call the style sheet, and that sets the colors of the fonts, everything, indentation, everything for all of the pages that are included. So you just say, hey, use the style sheet. So that's what we're going to learn, essentially, in terms of how we're going to format our websites when we create those assignments. We're going to have an external CSS file. And once you got it, you got it. You just keep using it. And it's going to give you the same look and feel every time you use that CSS file. And it cuts down on the number of tags that you have to write. So now you're thinking, well, for those of you who are originally thinking notepad, well, if you're writing in a notepad, it's like you have to do it by hand. You have to actually write the tags in there. If you don't believe it or not, if you follow a standard with a CSS, the tags actually it's pretty easy. You just write the text that you want in there. <laughs> it's not it's not as complicated as you might imagine. So let's take a look at the uh, components of a basic HTML. And this is where a lot of people actually get sloppy. And in the old days, they said, well, you know, you can write sloppy or you can write professional-looking HTML code. People who are sloppy never actually even heard of these tags <laughs> because they're not really required unless you're using a scripting language or unless you're using, unless you want to be XHTML compatible, unless you want to follow the standards. So inside of the document itself, the document should begin with a tag and end with a tag. So you have a document that say HTML on the top here, and that actually is a tag. It usually appears as the first tag in the document. If the document is HTML, and then you're wondering, well, why in the world do you have to do that if this is an HTML document? And I'm putting .html on the end of the document. Which actually brings up another thing I haven't mentioned during these. What's the difference between H .htm and .html? There's no difference. <laughs> now, one's standard, one's not standard. But the web browser is the difference. So now we'll, all web browsers pick up .html. For a while, I got sloppy. They reduced it to HTML because of the three file extension on Windows systems. They didn't support units, four, four characters on the end. So they, they hyphenated it, they abbreviated it. It's really the same. And the purpose of that is for the web browser. So you can take that same file and you put a .php extension on it. My browser is going to choke it up. <laughs> Actually, it's going to show you the text of the HTML instead of processing it as HTML. So when you put the opening tag of HTML at the top of your document, you're telling the web browser, and these are instructions you're giving the web browser. It has nothing to do with the internet, really. It's just a web browser that's interpreting this as, saying, hey, this is HTML code. All right, read it as HTML. Because what ends up happening is, you know, throughout this course, we are going to look at JavaScript, but you don't have to change anything with the file. Sometimes you have HTML code embedded inside of other files, PHP files. Um, which is another scripting language. Um, you might, well, usually you would take PHP as a main file type. It would be, you know, myfile.php and inside, and they have special opening and closing brackets for the PHP code. And then there you go, oh, HTML. I'm going to put HTML in here. Because what ends up happening is you have multiple readers reading this file. The readers that are supposed to be reading the PHP stuff on the server and will interpret that. The web browser will take a look, oh, every time it says HTML, the web browser interprets it. And it goes, oh, HTML. So basically, you're giving, providing instructions for interpretation um, in terms of what's going on. Oh, that person in the hallway is making noise. I'm like, what is that noise coming from? All right, so uh, two other important HTML tags are the head and the body. So uh, just as in Microsoft Word, where we have the introduction, the body paragraphs, and the conclusion, we actually have sections in an HTML document in order to be XHTML compatible, where we can say this is the header. Certain things belong in the head. Certain things belong in the body. Certain things belong, you know, inside of HTML brackets. It's going to be HTML code. So the head tag it contains information that's used by the web browser. So anything for the head. Uh, which would be what the title that's going to appear. And they're going to website. It's got these really cool scrolling 
stuff on the footer and on the top it says I'll scroll the name of your website, the title is appearing up there. Um, or let's say you uh, open up the web page and uh, you're on a, in a smartphone and it looks different because they put a tag, they put instructions on the head that said, hey, if you're on a mobile phone, get rid of all these graphics and just show the text. These graphics are going to take you on the load uh, on a mobile phone. Uh, so you put instructions for the web browser and you place it in the start of the HTML document when you open the tag, the HTML tag. So right after that you go ahead and then you close the head and you're done with the head and you start the body. And the body. This is what runs in the body. Um, so what we have here is the document head. Uh, so the tag pair of tags that contains the reference to the document. And then we'll see we have document. And believe it or not, this is slightly object oriented. <laughs> now when we look at the object oriented features, I'm not going to say it is 100%, it is not. But we can do object document, we the document dot write. And we can actually call the document, this is the document, and tell the web browser to write something on it. Or document dot refresh or something to, you know, or you know, something about the document as an object. Uh, and I'll get into that later in the course. Um, but we can actually put that stuff in the head and tell the web browser to do something interesting in this document. Uh, so following the document head is the body tag, which contains the document body. And what we're looking at is an opening and closing tag. And we're not necessarily putting text that we're having displayed. What we're doing is we're formatting the entire document. And we're using these tags. And uh, the body tag and the text in the tag, it contains the reference in anything going for the body of a particular document. Web browser processes, assembles the format of the HTML document. It's called parsing or rendering. So I called it parsing earlier. I like that word better. But some people like rendering. They come from a graphics background. We rendered the page. And yeah, parsed the page. <laughs> you write it in. You looked at the tags. You formatted it according to what the tags told you to do. So you can use various different parameters, and the parameters are called attributes. So we have tags. Tags could have parameters or attributes. Um, and you can configure many different types of tags with that, because you have many different types of attributes. As an example, the font tag has attribute size, has attribute color, has attribute, I don't know, size and color are the most popular. <laughs> but, uh, there's different ones to it as well. Type. Actually, you can change the font type to Times Roman or Script or something. Um, and those would be different characteristics that can be set. So you can set size is equal to 5. So you change the size of the font, so the color of the font. And then there's a built-in kind of preset uh, tag parameter list where actually, believe it or not, there's preset colors where you go, you know, colors equal to blue, you can go red, orange, so where you can use. Um, you know, asking RGB numbers if you wanted to as well. So you know, there's a lot of flexibility with the attributes. In fact, you can create your own attributes, believe it or not, and put and or create your own attribute styles and set your attributes in your CSS page. So it's applied every time you use a particular font. It's going to be in this particular size, in this particular color, or something. So you, you place an attribute before the closing tag of the starting tag. So when those little brackets on the opening and closing part the particular tag that you're working with. And it uh, separates it from the tag name and other attributes with a space. We'll see this in a lot more detail, but here's what we're looking at. I don't know if you can see that. No, you probably can see it. It's a little small for the people sitting in the back. Uh, but if you're sitting in the back and you can't see this, imagine a basic HTML document. <laughs> so, uh, some things to note is this HTML on the top, which is our closing. We have head that comes underneath it. And you're probably wondering, well, how come that you put that on two separate lines? Readability. You can actually put this all in one line, just like programming languages. You can put the entire program on one line and have a word wrap to the next line. Then. Not very readable. So with HTML, it's actually looking at readability because readability reads the right, leads to the writability. Easy modification, essentially. I personally get sloppy. I like to, I don't, I like to punch things up on one line because I don't like to be so big. But uh, you can actually clearly see we've got an HTML tag on the top and we've got an HTML tag on the bottom. An HTML tag on the bottom is a closing tag because it's got the first, it's got the forward slash in front of the word HTML down there. And uh, we have them in uh, reverse order. So if we start tag number one, two, three, four, and we close them, three, four, two, one, <laughs> reverse order, which is actually XHTML format. 
You don't even have to do it that way. However, if you don't, depending on how the document is parsed, it may or may not necessarily read exactly the way you want it to read. And it might have some differences. It might be inconsistent. Um, or you can actually be sloppy and leave out the closing tag. But you don't want to do that because it might cause problems. So the more close you are to the standard, then the easier it is to predict what's going to happen. Because what ends up happening is this page is not really the average size page that you would see. Your page is going to be twice as long or three times as long. And then uh, it's not going to be as easy to kind of find, where did I leave out that quote? How come the whole document's in blue? You know, how did that happen? And then you're going to wait, you know, looking for the wrong, you're looking for where the tag went wrong. And trust me, everybody in here has probably done that already if they've ever tried this before. Um, so we have the head, and we just we have, the only thing we have in the head is setting the title. This is our Hello World HTML page. <laughs> and we have Hello World is the title, and the title is going to actually show up in the title bar of the web browser because the head is actually giving instructions to the web browser. It does not give instructions to the web page. So if you have a scripting language or something, you can say, hey, use JavaScript in the head. Use this language or something. And then uh, we've got a couple of generic tags here, H1, H2. Those are for header 1, header 2. And it's going to print out, this is a header 1, this is a header 2. And then we're going to use a center tag. Don't worry right now, if you're brand new to this, you have no idea what these tags are. Gonna, that's what we're going to do starting next class meeting, is just start going through the tags and writing some HTML pages. Um, but I'm showing you this body. I'm showing you an example of the HTML. And then we have P for paragraph. This is going to start a new paragraph. Because here's what happens. Everything goes on sequentially. It's parsed sequentially. So the common mistake actually people have when they're brand new at this is they, they'll put some type, some text into a document. Actually, this is a really good experiment because you'll see what happens. They'll put a space here and a tab here. And, you know, and then they'll load it up in the web browser and they go, whoa, it's all word wrapped. <laughs> because unless you actually put a space in and use an ASCII character for a space, you don't get a space. All spaces are reduced down to one space. So 10 spaces equals one space. Because the browser doesn't know any better. It just parses what it sees. And uh, unless you put a P in for a new paragraph, it's not it's gonna be word wrapped. There's no new pair no no new line. It's just gonna be word wrapped. So we have line breaks, paragraph tags, tab tags, space tags, um, all tags for everything. So everything believe it or not, which is why people don't like to write native HTML. This is why people walk in going, eh, you know what, what you see what you get, drag it on the canvas. Yeah. Is the tools putting all those tags in for you instead? Uh, but that's not what you're doing for this course. All right, so then we have uh, HRs, a horizontal rule actually, and that will put in a line that goes across horizontal rule. And then uh, we have an image here, an image source. We're going to put in a. We're going to add an image, so you don't actually see the image. In fact, this is another thing people do. They use in Microsoft Word. I've actually had students do this before. <laughs> they use Microsoft Word. They, they insert the image into the document, and then they don't understand why the image doesn't show up. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 Word's not going to do it. So you have to actually put a tag in to say the source is this particular file. And then those people who figure out how to do that, then they upload everything to a website. And they go, how come the image doesn't show up? It's because the image moved locations, and you didn't upload the image. or you get the wrong URL for the image or something. So, there's so many different things. And that's one of the hardest parts, I think, with writing HTML code for even experienced website developers. And it's like, where did the bug? Where's the bug? <laughs> what did I forget to do? How come this isn't working? Yeah? Yeah, opening and closing horizontal rule doesn't actually, if you're doing X HTML, it's actually required. Yeah. If for, this is sloppy. Well. I shouldn't say this is sloppy. This is HTML syntax. If you're going to be sloppy, you just call it HTML. <laughs> if you wanted to call this XHTML and have it be comp compatible and actually have it come back as XHTML code, every opening must have a closing break. Must, must have a closing tag. And believe it or not, if you put in an H horizontal rule and you put in a four slash horizontal rule, you can try this out with your web browsers. Firefox will put it in one time. Internet Explorer will put two horizontal rules in. Because the horizontal rule says put a line across the screen. But I, Internet Explorer doesn't understand the doesn't understand the opening and closing because back in HTML, 
it wasn't a requirement to have an opening and a closing, and some tags didn't. For example, line break still doesn't have one. There's no, it doesn't make any sense. So when it's just a single, you put a closing in. So you'll see a single tag. In fact, if you want to be correct, you probably could have put a right here, put that, put one of these lines in here, forward line in the HR, and you could have gotten away because you have a closing, but you don't have an opening. But you only need one anyway. If you're, unless you're working with, well, actually, you only need one. If you put in the two, you end up with a problem. In some web browsers, it might put two lines in instead of one. It's not case sensitive. It's not case sensitive. No. That's it. Yeah, HTML is not case sensitive. It used to be in Mozilla, like in some of the earlier web browsers, and then they got rid of it. Everything had to be lowercase. Now you see a lot of HTML in uppercase because it's easier to find the tags. <laughs> Much easier to look at and go, where? Oh, there's the HR. <laughs> there's the, here it is. Um, otherwise, it's really hard to see it. But now you can you can put the openings in lowercase and the closings in uppercase and vice versa. It's a combination of all. Usually people will use lowercase, however, for some reason. Um, very good observations, actually. And uh, any other? Good observations or questions about the thing? And if you're bored, so far you're going to be bored with the course because this course is real basic. You know, I get a variety of students at IT, some with, uh, some with master's degrees in software engineering and computer science already. Yeah, we're sitting there going, why am I taking, and then I have to ask, why are you taking an HTML course then? Uh, all right, so web page design and authoring. Uh, so what do we got? The web page design or web design refers to the visual design creation of the document and how it appears. And uh, she's referred to as the design. In fact, web design is different from code writing, HTML development. It's just more vocabulary for you. Web authoring refers to the creation and the assembly of the tags, the attributes, the pages that are in the markup language. So that's when nobody ever uses the word authoring anymore. They always use web design that actually represents everything for some reason. So. Don't worry, we're going to leave in about 15 minutes. I'm looking at the watch. Now. People are getting up and leaving already. <laughs> it is 410. I'm really soon. I know it's only the first day. So. And technically, this is the first day because we don't actually have this class. Even if I had class last week, I would not have had this class. Classes didn't start till Wednesday. <laughs> but could you imagine what would have happened? Maybe what this class would have been behind two weeks. No. No, yeah, no, yeah, from the Wednesday. It wouldn't have been synced up correctly with the Wednesdays. Anyway, I should stop commenting. <laughs> so, all right, so the uh, distinction, subtle but important distinction here. So a book on web design teaches the visual and graphical aspects associated with creating web pages. So that's an interesting phenomenon. You go to the library and you say, ah, oh, she didn't give us a book for this course, but I really, it's my first class in HTML and I want to buy a book. Insisting on spending money on a book. So I look at web design and I don't get anything on HTML. And then I look at web authoring. Oh, yeah, there's where the HTML stuff comes into. And that's basically the distinction. So the book on H X HTML teaches the basic concepts you need to get started, how tags and attributes are working. Don't look for a web design book. If you look for a web design book, you're going to get, well, not a bad thing to learn, but you're going to get, you know, here's an image, here's the size of the image, it should be no longer. No bigger or no wider than the longest sentence of the paragraph or something. Keep your fonts to a minimum of three different sizes per website. Actually, that is a general rule. Three. Menus go, in at, go into length of three you know, as, as a general rule. I don't know, that just good way, interface design with like these standards of best practices. So the W3Cs. Uh, web page begin to find necessity to write slightly different HTML code every time they write it in web browsers, which they uh, anticipate their web page would be opened in. And so what we end up with is a growing need to have uh, things that are compatible. So we address the growing need for standards um, in terms of the World Wide Web. We have the construction of W3Cs, 1994, actually, was when it was invented. And MIT, and it the development of web page technologies. Believe it or not, nothing on the internet is standard. In fact, TCP is not even a standard. IP is, but TCP is not actually. It's, it's not, it doesn't conform to a generalized standard. But it's pretty consistent because it needs compatibility. Well, web browsers aren't standard either. 
why do you think we have three or four different ones on the market? <laughs> and we continue to have new web browsers coming out. Half of them are semi-compatible, a little bit of compatible, but they're all supporting different things. In fact, a good example of this is how come the iPad doesn't support Flash? <laughs> it's not standard, but everybody uses it. So, so when we make it, shouldn't it be standard? Shouldn't all web browsers support Flash, per se? And that's why I don't like my iPhone. I can my, that's why I don't like my iPad, actually, because it doesn't support Flash. I mean, web page you, get to, you go to, it has Flash in it, anyway. So it doesn't release a version of this particular technology. Instead, it uses a formal recommendation uh, for the technology, which essentially means that the technology is or will be recognized by the industry worldwide um, or as nationwide as a standard. So the W3C is just basically a consortium to promote standardization in a non-standard environment and to create compatibility so that things are more predictable to the user and more predictable for the developer. Keeps everybody on the same page. So if you conform to it, it means you're compatible with it, and then you can test your web pages and say, yeah, hey, look, it's, it works. It's going to work on 90% of the browsers that are on the market or something. So web browsers. Uh, a little bit of history. We'll finish up the introduction here on, uh, on web browser stuff. Internet Explorer browser is being used by more than 85% of the market in 2004. Well, it's still six years ago. It's still pretty, believe it or not, it's a pretty big wide market share for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, Netscape Navigator also makes up, uh, I don't think they're, well, Mozilla, makes up a big percentage. Oh, there's pretty not that, this is kind of outdated, I think. In fact, they have a Chrome's on the list. <laughs> the Google browser is not out, out here yet. They're getting more market share, which is really good. Three uh, traditional web browsers that are. Uh, worth noting, I guess. Maya, well, yeah. Actually, all three of these are still uh, still being used. Your web, your web browser may vary. In fact, it's kind of interesting. In fact, you could probably tell somebody's personality by what web browser they use. I don't know. The Microsoft people, they will always use Internet Explorer. And Apple people will use Firefox. And then Google Fanatics, they'll use Chrome constantly. <laughs> So you must test your web page and every browser and every browser version if you're going to anticipate how it's going to be open, which makes it kind of difficult to do website development, which is why people are wanting a standard, which is why people go to the W3Cs and say, all right, consortium, tell us who's abiding by what, how can we do things? So people stay away from certain libraries of certain tools and things so that they can be more compatible. And there's a huge decision that you have to make in terms of the website designer. Am I going to use Splash? Am I going to use JavaScript? Well, JavaScript is supported by everything. Actually, I shouldn't say that. A lot of cellular phones don't support Java. You know, if you've got Java, JavaScript, excuse me, or Java, actually. So depending upon what mobile device you're running, you might actually have a problem as well. So, this is our stopping point for our first class meeting, which I try normally to make shorter, just to give you a break. Because some people might drop this class after they listen to me today. <laughs> so, uh, next time when we come back, it'll be after you've been to the beach and you've barbecued and stuff like that. And uh, so it's not next Monday, it's the following Monday. And then we're going to start in, so you, know, you don't really have any homework or anything else that are reading through the syllabus and stuff. And I wouldn't jump out and get a web space yet. You're probably not going to need it for a couple more weeks. But uh, yeah, enjoy your vacation. <laughs> I'll see you next time. <laughs>